And now it's time for Power of Prophecy with your host, former professor at the University of Texas at Austin, career United States Air Force officer, and best-selling author, Tex Mars. Hello, friends. This is Tex Mars. Welcome to another edition of Power of Prophecy. Well, today we've got a powerful message, a powerful message. Have you ever had a person tell you, judge not? Don't judge me, they say. Or who are you to judge? Or they'll tell you that they don't judge anybody. They're so meek, they're so loving, they're so good. <laughs> so all loving, so accepted, uh, accepting, so humble, so... Oh, they're just syrupy, sweet, and they accept everybody, and they're tolerant. And they don't know why you are not tolerant, why you are so harsh and cruel and divisive and judgment-oriented. Well, you know, I get about, oh, one or two, maybe three letters a week. Folks tell me I'm just judgmentally. I'm just a, an evil person, and, and God's going to judge me for that, and God's going to punish me, and I'm going to go to hell and 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 text you. You know you're, you know you're going the wrong way here. You know you're criticizing God's man or God's child or or God didn't tell us to judge anybody. And Christians, you know, we're aspiring to be Christians, and we're not supposed to judge. And they'll go on and on and on. And, and you know, it's enough to make a. <laughs> A worldly Christian, did you notice I said worldly Christian, sort of upset. Now, nobody likes to be judged. Nobody likes for somebody to judge them. But every one of these letters that I receive where these people say horrible things about me, I, and they tell me, don't judge, don't judge this you know, a person, that person. Don't say anything about that person. And, and I... I have to sort of scratch my head because they're judging me. Now, you see, <laughs> when a person writes me and says you're a horrible person because you're judgmental, they're judging me, aren't they? Who are they to say that I, I'm to be judged? First, they give me their criteria and they say, Jesus told us not to judge. Judge not that ye be not judged. And, you know, I have to admit that's Matthew 7, verse 1. Jesus said it. He said, judge not that ye be not judged. And it, it is true. I've, I've judged a lot of men. And you know, I, I've, I have an entire video about blind men. The, the, the blind and the dead. It's, it's all about pastors and church leaders. Who, who are, who are into false doctrines and false teachings and, and I really blast them. I mean, my goodness, I really judge them. And these people write to me and say, who are you to say bad things about these great men of God? And sometimes they say, look how much more they've done than you. They, they have huge audiences. They have crusades. They, so and so had a hundred thousand, one hundred thousand people show up at his crusade. And who are you, you little mealy mouth? Puffed up little man. You can't even get 500 or 1,000 at your meetings. This man is a great man. Everybody everybody says he is. America says he's on the 10 most admired list. In fact, he's number one. Sometimes has been. Who are you to say anything bad about him? And they judge me. That's their first statement is... They point out how I've judged, and then they turn around and judge me. Now, I don't know if you see the irony there, but how can they tell me not to judge, and then they turn around and judge me? Oh, well, see, I'm judging you, Tex Mars, because you've judged others. Well, it doesn't say there. It doesn't say in Matthew 7, 1, judge not that ye be not judged, but it's okay to judge somebody who has judged. Now, I added that on there. They add it on there all the time. Judge not that you be not judged, but if you have judged, you're going to be judged. Well, <laughs> I wonder about these people. 
Why don't they just forget it? They're so aroused, so angry at me, so so furious that I'm a judge. And they say we're not to judge. Well, I, you know, I, I want to talk about this a little bit because I'm just going to keep judging. Now, I hear this. In fact, the Pope said it recently. He was asked about homosexuals in the Catholic Church. Did, did he, does he have any words of admonition for them? Does he have anything to say that they need to not do those terrible things? He, he answered by saying, who am I to judge? He doesn't judge them. So, you know, if he finds something wrong with them, well, he's just going to keep his mouth shut. Going to keep silent. Okay? It, it seems then that, that he's a wonderful, merciful, good man. He doesn't say anything bad about anybody. You know, I've always wondered about it. You know, I, I've <laughs> I've gone to a few funerals and sat there where the pastor said, Brother so-and-so who's passed away now was a wonderful man. I never heard him say a bad word about anybody. That seems to be the standard, doesn't it? Or have you ever been over somebody's house and they're talking about Sister Jones? Sister Jones is a precious sister in Christ. She's so sweet. She's gentle and meek and kind. I've never heard her say a bad word about any soul at all. She's always got something good to say about everybody. And you feel inside, well, goodness, maybe I'm doing something wrong. I'm not gentle and kind like Sister Jones. She never says a bad word about anybody. And I, I have a bad word pretty often here. <laughs> maybe I better look in the mirror and clean up my act. Maybe maybe I'm, maybe the Pope is right. Now, who am I to judge? Who are you to judge, my friend? Think about it. Well... I think we need to look very carefully at what Jesus said. You see, that's not all he said about judging. Oh, there's all kinds of things in the Bible he said about judging. In fact, <laughs> I could give sermon after sermon after sermon just on what Jesus said about judging. But I've just told you one, judge not that you be not judged, Matthew 7, 1. Now, the Pope's not the only one who's not judging. I was on Fox News Network just this week, and there was Franklin Graham sitting there, and uh, this guy from a uh, first Baptist, pastor of First Baptist Church. See what is his name? Oh, I, I'll remember it in a minute. Don't worry. I just have a senior moment. He's he's the, the pastor of First Baptist Church. I I really like the guy, but he's very judgmental. Oh, he's judgmental. He's very judgmental. But I like the guy. I'm gonna tell you a little bit why I do like the guy. Maybe I'll even remember his name. Who knows? <laughs> or maybe you'll judge me. Tex don't remember anything. Boy, he's getting Alzheimer's. Well, I probably am. <laughs> you can go ahead and judge me for that. <laughs> My wife says sometimes I'll forget a lot. But, uh, you know, uh, so what? I forget. Last night, one that woke me up. Now, we, we sleep in the dark. Do you, do you sleep in the dark? Some people, some people like a TV on when they're sleeping. Boy, I think that's sort of crazy, but... Who am I to judge, right? <laughs> Some people like to leave the light on when they're sleeping. Boy, that's sort of not so, but after all, who am I to judge? Now, <laughs> but one and I like it nice and quiet and the, the lights off and it's dark and you just really Z out, you know. But last night, one that grabbed me on the shoulder and shook me and said, <laughs> we were sleeping at about three in the morning. She said, who are you? I said, who am I? <laughs> I'm your I'm your husband, Tex. She said, you're Tex? I said, sweetheart, it's dark, but I am Tex. Yes, I'm Tex. <laughs> I've been laying here about 40 years now, you know. <laughs> I know it's dark, but you probably should even recognize me in the dark, you know. <laughs> and she was quiet for just a minute, and she said, oh, 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 yes, I'm sorry. I must be dreaming. Well, so I, I had to laugh, you know, and I hugged her neck and I said, don't worry about it. It's, you know, just something that happens. Has that ever happened to you? Well, you probably not, but never happened to me either, but it happens to Wanda. Jerry's over here at the, he's a, the broadcast engineer. He said it happens to him sometime, you know. I think I'm going to learn what, what to say in case it does happen to me because Wanda probably won't take it lightly. I take it lightly, but if I ask Wanda, who are you? 
She'd say, why, you dirty old dog. You know, <laughs> you forget I'm your wife. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I may really be judged then. Oh, there's all kinds of judgments in this world. There really are. You know, when I was an Air Force officer, I had to judge among enlisted men. I, and I wrote um, performance reports on some of their officers. I had to say what kind of officer they were. Did they do an outstanding job or just satisfactory? Were they, did they dress good? Did they look good in their uniform? Were they overweight? Were they this or that? Were they honest? Were they men of integrity? Were they hard workers? On and on and on. I had to judge them. Now, I didn't have an option. I couldn't say, hey, I don't want to judge this man. If I'd have done that, then my commander would have had me in fun and said, why didn't you judge that man? That's your job. If you don't want your job, we'll give it somebody else. So I judged them. I judged many a man. Had to. But sometimes it was great fun. It was great. To, it, it, it really was a wonderful thing to have a, a, a man who did have integrity, who really cared, hard worker. I like to write about him. And every once in a while, I'd have some crud. Oh, he was no good. And I enjoyed writing about him, too. <laughs> I wrote bad things about him sometimes. And he'd come to see me, you, you know, you're going to hurt my career. You said these things about me. Well, they're true. You should have fixed this up. Now, I, I always gave people an opportunity to correct their behavior. You know, about 90 days before they were going to get that performance report, I called him and said, listen, I'm not happy with your performance. Let me tell you why. I want to give you an opportunity now. You've got about 90 days to start correcting your behavior and show me that you can do better. I gave them an opportunity, and many of them did do better, and they, they got improved ratings. So you need to be fair with all men. That's true. In fact, Jesus actually says in another place in the Bible, he says about judgment, he says, exercise righteous judgment. Exercise righteous judgment. In other words, use righteous judgment. So he tells you in that passage to use judgment, but make sure it's righteous. If, if you're out there lying, you're an adulterer, you're mischievous, you're this, you're that, first clean up your own act before you go out and judge others. You see, and, and, and then be fair to them. Be fair to people. It's not right to judge them just because you know, for some reason, maybe they don't agree with you on this or that or what. You know, it's some little picayune thing. Be fair. And make sure it's a righteous judgment. You know, <laughs> but, but it really bothers me that people judge not. It does. Now, Franklin Graham was on Fox News recently. And as you know, we now have two nominees for president of the United States. We have Donald Trump, Republican, and uh, Hillary Clinton as the Democrat. And we know about Hillary's unrighteousness, don't we? There, there's no doubt that she's a criminal, and that's proven over and over. By the way, it hasn't only been proven with her, with her emails. It's been proven up and down the line. She's been called a murderer, a thief. And she's taken all these, well, they're really bribes and all these. It goes on and on. I mean, I've, I've never seen somebody that had such a unrighteous record as Hillary Rodham Clinton. And everybody knows that. Everybody knows it. Now, as an American, you're to judge, aren't you? You say, no, well, then you don't want to vote. you got to vote. If you're a good citizen, you should vote. And you got two choices there. Now, you got you to choose. So you have to judge. But Franklin Graham was asked by Sean Hannity on the Hannity show on Fox. He said, are you going to endorse Donald Trump, the Republican? And Franklin Graham says, no, I'm not going to endorse anybody. I'm, I'm not going to vote either for Republican or Democrat. Okay, well, that's good. Well, who are you going to vote for? That's all we have, <laughs> Republican or Democrat. And then he was asking about Hillary, Rodham Clinton. You know, Hannity started talking about the things that she, that she had done, these crimes. She's under investigation, of course, for her criminal activity by the FBI. 
And she's definitely a criminal, but he was asking about that, and he said, oh, I don't judge. I'm not going to judge her on that. That's not my job. I, I don't want to judge. So it's okay to, if you don't tell somebody who you're going to you're vote for or who you don't vote for. But why did he say that? I'm not going to judge. I don't want to judge. He's a Christian pastor, isn't he? He's one of the best known pastors in America, but he says, I'm not going to judge. Seems like he's, he's jumped aboard the, uh, the train with the Pope. The Pope's over there saying, who am I to judge? And there's old Franklin Graham saying, who am I to judge? Hmm. There are many people depending on Franklin Graham's judgment. They want to know what he has to say. They want it to be righteous judgment. They want him to exercise sound judgment. But they want him to open his mouth. Speak up, man. But he said, uh, I can't do that. I'm just going to pray for everybody. That's what he said. You know, that's sort of, sort of what they say. You, you go see a, a pastor and say, is, is abortion wrong? The pastor says, well, let's pray for them. Well, is it wrong? Well, you know, I, I don't want to be judgmental. There's a lot of people that believe in abortion and a lot not, but, but I'm just not going to judge. Hmm. I don't think that man's being a pastor. You, you know, the Bible tells the pastor he's a shepherd of the flock. Now, I know that sheep can't speak, but sometimes a sheep would be good to speak, and they ask their shepherd, should I go down that path or this path? Well, there might be a wolf waiting down that path. If the pastor knows about that, the shepherd knows about that wolf down there, he's not going to let the guy, he's not going to let the sheep go down there, is he? But there's Franklin Graham. I don't know. Uh, 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 I saw a wolf down there, but I don't want you to judge him as a wolf. He's, he may be a good guy. He may just look like a wolf, may have wolf's clothing on, I think that's a recipe for disaster, don't you, my friends? The failure to speak. You know, when I was a young man, I think I was about 16 the first time I, I saw it, I, I, I saw somebody had a plaque on their wall and it read this. It read, not to decide is to decide. And I thought about that. Now, I've always been a person to judge. I have to say, I I really have. I'm I'm one of those judges, Yeah. But but I, I think about that. Not to decide is to decide. Hmm. Think about that. Not to decide is to decide. And my friends, let me say the same thing goes for judgment. Not to judge is to judge. Well, John is having an affair with Sally, but he's married to Susie. What do you think about that, Tom? Tom says, well, I'm not going to judge that. Hmm. I don't think Tom was being fair. I don't think he's being fair to anybody there in that situation. Do you? Now, I'm not asking him to be a bull in a china shop and to go right in, barge in, and be a big busybody and get everybody all fired up. But the Bible says when you when a person is caught in sin, you you meekly point out their sin to them. You don't wait till the whole church is full or your living room is full and say, hey, I want everybody to know here, John's doing such and such with so and so. And no, no. But it might be a good idea to go privately to them and, and to discuss it with them. You know, you, you might be saving some lives. And I'm talking about spiritual lives. You might be doing somebody a great favor. Now, it's so prevalent to say, don't judge. But I want to bring you up several points of that. Now, first of all, this is a pop culture fad. Don't judge me. Now, that, that's the quickest way to shut up somebody, isn't it, friends? I, I mean, when a person is confronted about issues that, that need to be addressed, for example, if a person is promoting abortion or is going to have an abortion, and you tell the person... Please don't have that abortion. That's killing a baby. They may retort back to you. Well, you're being very judgmental. Who are you to judge? Hmm. People love that, don't they? They love to tell you, don't judge. But you see, God has given us certain standards. 
And I, I want to propose to you something that's very important in the Bible. There's a principle here. When you sin, and you know in your heart that you're sinning, you are opposing yourself. Did you hear what I said? You are opposing yourself. Now, you may lie to yourself. You may say, well, I, I'm, it's really not wrong because, you know, my wife's done such, such, so, or my husband's done this, and I, I have a right to have pleasure and fun in life, and I'm this and that. But you know, you know what you're doing, friends. You know that's wrong. You, you, you know that that's in contradiction to God's law. And God's law is the best thing for you. You're opposing yourself. And if you reject God's law, you've done yourself a terrible disservice. I want, I want to bring that to your attention. That might be why somebody has, in your opinion, become a busybody. Now, in the Gospel of John, in the, uh, not in the Gospel, but in the, the Epistle of John, it says, he, he told us, we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Now, I want you to think about that. Are you of God, my friends? Then you'll know it. And you know the whole world lieth in wickedness. And you understand what that wickedness is. Now Jesus judged a lot of people. He judged the Pharisees. He told them, your father is the devil. And then he judged the devil. He said he was a, a, a murderer and a liar. He's the father of lies. Has anybody ever told you you're a murderer? You're the father of lies? How much more harsh could a person be than Jesus? He, he saw the money changers in the temple, and he was angered about it and overthrew their tables. And I'm sure the, the leaders of the temple, the rabbis came out and said, What are you doing? Who are you to do these things? Who gave you the right? to throw out the money changers in our temple. You know, when Peter went to Jesus and Jesus had been arrested and was about to be tried, Peter told him, I'm going to, you know, even before that happened, Peter said, I'm, I'm going to be faithful to you. I'm not going to let that happen, Jesus. I'm right with you. you know, I, I've had a few friends like that. <laughs> I'm going to back you. Yeah, they're back all right, way back. <laughs> you know about those kind of people. Well, that's what Peter was, really. He, he meant it. He meant well, no doubt. Don't worry. They're not going to do any harm to you, Jesus. They're not going to rest and take you away. I'm here. I'm for you. I'm your pal. I'm backing you. But Jesus told him before, you hear the rooster. Crows three times, you will have betrayed me. Oh, no, I, I won't. Jesus told, Jesus judged him in advance. Because Jesus, of course, knew what was going to happen. People desperately don't want to be judged. And I can sort of understand. They, they like to get away with their sin and have as little commotion about it or as little judgment as possible. But Paul, the Apostle Paul, told the church, why do you not judge? See, they had a situation in the church. It was a case of, well, it was incest, really. And they, they let the man and the woman get away with it. And the church didn't, didn't judge them. And Paul said, why don't you judge? Now, there's a case for you. Why don't you judge? He said, do you not know that when you go to heaven, as Christians, you're going to judge the angels in heaven? Whoa. Think about that, friends. The angels are supposed to be so angelic, so wonderful, so loving, so good. I mean, they're angels. How can you judge an angel? Well, God's going to give you the standards to judge. 
You know, in any trial, the judge just doesn't fly by the seat of his pants. The judge and jury have standards. They have laws written. And the laws tell them what is acceptable and what isn't. And when it's a violation of the law, it, it, it explains it. And when it's not a violation, they let the guy go, don't they? They, they acquit him or her. But they have standards. And they apply those standards. They don't just make it up as they go along. Well, I know the Supreme Court does quite a bit, but <laughs> that's maybe an exception. Some other judges do too, and that's to their shame. But Paul said, he, he wrote him a letter and he said, I've judged this case and I'm not even there. Wow. That's being judgmental, isn't it? You, you, you're to gather all the facts to find out as much as you can about the situation. And then Paul says, you judge. And if you can't judge within the church, how are you going to judge the angels in heaven? Wow. Wow. My friends, if you don't judge people, if you don't judge based on sound judgment standards and principles that are given to us in the Bible, then you're not a Christian. You're a pretender. You're Satan's tool. You're a hoax. You're, you're, you're playing Christian. Friends, you must judge all things to see whether they are right or wrong. And God has written on your heart the standards. We have a judicial system in America. It ranges all the way from town clerks to the Supreme Court. You know, when I was in college, I got a degree in political science. And they sent us, each student a month had to go and serve like an internship somewhere. So I went down to the city hall, small little town in Missouri there, and I helped the city clerk to do various things for that month, and she was very happy for my assistance. And they had a judge there, a city judge. And he took a liking to me as a young man, you know, and he would come in every day at lunch, and he didn't invite me. We'd get a sandwich or something, and he'd just, oh, he was a talker. He was he was about 89 years old, city judge. <laughs> I was a young man. I said, sir, what are your qualifications? You know, how did you get to be the city judge? He said, well, I ran for the office and they voted me in. It's okay. He's actually, I haven't had one hour of law school, not one. He was sort of proud of that. He said, I just judge based on what I see. I said, really? You don't go back to the law books? And he, no, I don't. He said, I can tell whether cases. <laughs> Now, mostly he was a traffic court judge. Boy, they gave a lot of tickets because a, 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 a state highway, U.S. highway actually, ran right through that little town. He said, I know when they're lying and when they're not. I can find them. And he invited me to come. To, he said, come, come listen to me one night in court. You'll see. So I did. I, I went down there and listened to the guy. And I really had a revelation from listening to that old fellow. He was a pretty good judge. Now, when we come back in a minute, I'm going to tell you about that judge. Remember now, he had never, he didn't know what the law was, never studied law. In fact, he was a railroad detective. He was a railroad detective and retired. What did he do as a railroad detective? Well, he was the guy that went around and checked all the boxcars. If he found somebody in the boxcar that wasn't supposed to be there, he pulled them out and beat them with a stick or something. <laughs> That's the best I could figure out what he did. He didn't let anybody ride the train that wasn't supposed to ride the train. That was his job. Check the box scores. He was a railroad detective. I guess he made a quick judgment right then. You don't have a ticket? What are you doing riding? Get out. <laughs> I will tell you how this guy judged a case. I thought it was a pretty good deal. When we return in just a minute, you're listening to Power of Prophecy. I'm Tex Mars, and we're determining, should you judge? I'll be right back. Hello, friends. Have you ordered, have you received, and have you read my new book, Holy Serpent of the Jews? Holy Serpent of the Jews. You know, the title alone is a strange title, and the cover is even 
more odd. It, it, it's a picture of a huge, horrible black serpent, sort of a blue-black, and a, a child is coming out of his mouth or else it's going in. Is the child being consumed or, or what? What's going on here? Holy Serpent of the Jews. And the, the, the subtitle really commands your attention. It reads, The Rabbi's Secret Plan for Satan to Crush Their Enemies and Vault the Jews to Global Dominion. Did you know there's a secret plan? It's in their Talmud. It's in their Kabbalah. And it's even in the Holy Bible. Isn't it interesting? I've been working on yet another book that's going to explain to you what the Bible says about the Jews' plan. But the rabbis have a secret plan. This book explains it all. It's an amazing plan. And it proves that Judaism is the most colossal devil religion ever conceived. Because the Jews worship the serpent. They even give him a name. Of course, we know about the beast that comes up out of the pit. Revelation 9, Revelation 11. The beast, that's the serpent. That's Satan. That old devil. The dragon, he's called. You know, Jesus told the Jews, he accused them of being serpents. He said, ye serpents, ye generation, that means race, of vipers. He accurately said their religion was, quote, of man-made traditions. You know, a lot of people say, Tex, why do you criticize the Jews' religion? I mean, isn't Christianity just the fulfillment of Judaism? Ooh. Whoa. Now, Jesus gave the Jews certain rules, standards to live by. If they had been able to keep those standards... And to follow the rules that Jesus gave, I wouldn't be here today telling you that they're the most colossal devil religion ever. But they veered off. They got into man-made traditions. They said, no, we don't like those rules. We're going to have our own rules. And they wrote entire books, entire uh, volumes explaining their man-made traditions. And they set up something called the synagogue of Satan. Revelation 2, Revelation 3. Now, now that was over 2,000 years ago. Have they gotten better today? No, my friends, the, the Jewish religion is more wicked than ever. When it left the folds of God, when they said we're not going to follow Jesus' way, or God's way, because they've never believed in Jesus, they've gone far, far Diverse. You know, my friends, in the Air Force, we have checklists. Because there are a lot of important pieces of equipment, even intercontinental ballistic missile. And, you know, if you shoot a missile off into space, and it may be, you may, your calibrations may be off just a little tiny bit. Maybe you aim this missile at, I don't know, maybe the moon. And your calculations are off just ever so slightly. But as that missile flies off into space, it goes further and further and further away. And it might miss the mark by miles. The rabbis today slanderously call Jesus a bastard, a sorcerer, a blasphemer in their Talmud, their man-made traditions. And worse is that they have a, a literal code of hell that they have written up in their Kabbalah. Oh, no, Jesus didn't write the Kabbalah. Jesus didn't write the Talmud. That's why they worship the serpent. Because they can't stand the words of Jesus. They hate Jesus. They despise him. And I tear the veil off in this book. I tear the veil off. Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. And this book explains why. These are the, you're going to see this book almost, you might say it was written by the rabbis because I quote rabbi after rabbi after rabbi. People say, text, where did you get this information? I have never read a book that explained that the, the Jews worship the serpent as a holy being. He's their Messiah. He's their redeemer. That, that can't be true. Oh, but it is. 
No, they don't tell Gentiles. In fact, did you know their Talmudic law says that they are worthy of death if they teach you the Talmud? That's why you've never heard this. That's why they don't go on TV and, and say, listen, you Gentiles, I want you all to know about our serpent. But I've gone out and I've discovered it. I, I, I've gone and I've listened to the sermons of, 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 of dozens of rabbis. I've, I've studied their books. I've gone back into their Talmud Kabbalah and I found out what they believe about the serpent. He is their companion, their helpmate, their guide, their redeemer, their Messiah. He's their God. He's their God. He's the source of universal light, they say. And rabbis are the ones saying it. The most famous rabbis in the world tell the Jews, the serpent is your friend. They say there was no original sin in the Garden of Eden. They say the serpent did Adam and Eve a great favor. He put them on the, the path to godhood, they say. I want you to get this book for yourself. I want you to judge for yourself. Yes, my friends, judge for yourself. Judge what the rabbis say. They say it, now you discover it. You will discover the rabbis' secret plan for Satan to crush their enemies and vault the Jews to global dominion, and you judge it. You say, I can't judge them. I'm not a judge. Then shut up. You're not a Christian either. Judge them, my friends. Exercise righteous judgment. The Lord says so. All of the disciples say so. Do that and be happy. This book is just $20. Add $5 shipping and handling. A total of $25. It's 224 pages long. Please call us right now. Toll free 1-800-234-9673. 1-800-234-9673. Two three four nine six seven three, or you can go to our website, which is textmars.com or powerofprophecy.com. Use your charge card or PayPal and get it. Get this book. By the way, a man called in this week and he he ordered numerous copies of it. He wants to give one to everybody he knows. Well, good for him. I, that's what we want. I promise you, we will not make money with this book. We're not going to make money with this book. Because there are many bookstores that are frightened. They're fearful. They say, oh, no, I don't want a, a Holy Serpent of the Jews a book by that title. Oh, no, we, we can't have that in our store. Oh, oh, that's being so judgmental. Yeah, well, they'll have to take that up with God. They'll have to speak with Jesus about that. But I know that Jesus wants me to exercise righteous judgment. That's why I wrote this book. And I believe Jesus will speak to your heart. And, and, and tell you, get this book. Know what your enemies are teaching and believe. That's the only way you can help them, my friends. That's the only way you can teach them about Jesus Christ, about the kingdom of God, is to know the truth. By the way, write to us, 1708 Patterson Road, 1708 Patterson Road, Austin, Texas, 78733. Send $25 and say, Tex, send me Holy Serpent of the Jews. And we'll get it right on its way to you. All right, we're back again. You know, I told you about the judge. I went to his court and a guy came, <laughs> came in and <laughs> he brought his lawyer in with him. And he had been, you know, found guilty, I think, of driving, you know, 20 miles over the limit. And so the judge says, what have you got to say, you know, to the lawyer? And the lawyer Boy, he had a, a list of things. Your Honor, according to the law book, such and such, this happened, that happened. And my, so, so you see, you know, you really can't judge my client because, you know, judge says, guilty. <laughs> just, all right, guilty. Next case. I, I, I was shocked. He didn't even discuss it. He was guilty. So I asked the judge afterwards, I said, tell me, that man brought his lawyer in there. And he was talking about some kind of thing about, you know, if it doesn't, if it's around a corner and it doesn't, he was finding some kind of excuse. The judge said, well, you just said it yourself, Tex. He was making excuses. I know that, Connor. I know what's all, what it's all about. He could have stopped at that red light. 
Uh, but, but he, he didn't. I don't care whether there's a corner there or not where he couldn't see. I don't care whether there's an obstruction or not. He should have stopped. Shouldn't have been going that fast. Blah, 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 blah. So, <laughs> he says, but let me just tell you, Tex, what I do. If a person brings a lawyer to my court, I always find them guilty. Always. I said, you do? <laughs> he said, oh, yes. I figure if they've got enough money for a lawyer, they got enough money to appeal. So I just let them appeal. Let them appeal it. <laughs> and I had to laugh. Let them appeal it. If they got a lawyer, <laughs> let them appeal. I think that guy was a lot more wise than some gave him credit for, don't you? Okay, now let's be talking a little bit more here about judgment. About judgment. You know, we're all stand before God. And, you know, we don't have any lawyers. We're going to have to answer for ourselves, aren't we? Now, let's read this wonderful passage in Matthew chapter 7, verses uh, uh, 1 through 5, about judgment. I think Jesus puts down several wonderful principles here. He said, Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considereth not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye? And behold, a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote of thy brother's eye. <laughs> you know, a mote is a small thing. It's a little piece, a little, little matter. You ever got a little, you just call it, a, we can go ahead and call it a mote. You ever got a mote in your eye, boy, it's just, oh, it's irritating, isn't it? You're trying to get it out and you push it further in. You know, you're blinking your eye and you go get some water and put on it. That's getting a mote in your eye. But now, getting having a beam in your eye, that's different, isn't it? <laughs> what is a beam? That's like a telephone pole. Man, think about a telephone pole in your eye. Which would you rather have, a little moat or a, a telephone pole in your eye? Well, I think I know. <laughs> we, can, we, we can judge that one real quick, can't we? But think, Jesus said, first take out the huge piece of matter in your own eye, and then you'll be able to see clearly the moat that is, you know, sometimes I get get one and I'll get a little bit of, little wood, piece of wood or something stuck in my foot. And I, I just can't get it out. You know, I try and try and get it. It's so tiny in your foot. I'll say, Wanda, would you get a needle and maybe put a little alcohol on or something and, and get that out, dig that, that out of my foot? She'll complain a little bit, but she always does it, you know. <laughs> She'll complain a little bit. Oh, I, I, I don't want to hurt you. It's so hard to see. So I, you know, she digs it out though. If if you don't dig it out, it's going to get worse and worse. Start festering and maybe get infected. You got to get that little moat, that little matter of a little wood piece out. But think of having a bean stuck in you. Well, that's pretty tough. I mean, <laughs> if you have a friend or a brother, or a sister, and and they've got a little matter, a little, little moat in their eye, you're going to be helping them out if you help them to take that out of their eye. If they just go on and pretend it's not there, it's going to get worse and worse, isn't it? You're doing them a favor by helping get it out of their eye. But, but you know, you, you don't have time for that if you've got a big beam in your own eye. You better get to the hospital as fast as you can, my friends. <laughs> you got a problem. And that's what Jesus said. He says, First cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the moat of thy brother's eye. Now, did Jesus say that not to judge? No. He says to judge and judge rightly. Make sure you don't have the same sin in your life. Or worse sins in your life. You know, it could be the situation of that woman caught in adultery described in the Bible. 
There she was. She was caught in it, right in the act of adultery, evidently. I don't know just how, how far she went. But they, they, they grabbed her, these Jewish brothers. Let's just call them that. They're not my brothers. But these Jews caught her and took her out, and they were going to stone her to death. And there was Jesus. Oh, my, my. There was Jesus. What was he going to do? I, I, I'm sure that if a rabbi was around, he was watching this very closely. Let's see what he, let's see if he upholds the law. The law says we should, would stone her to death for that great sin she had. She was caught in adultery. What's he going to do? And all these men, they had, they had rocks. They were ready to stone her. Boy, they were just uh, angry. She was probably cowering. She was, I mean, within seconds of dying. And, and, and they asked Jesus, look at this woman. She was caught in adultery. Should we not stone her to death? You know, I've, <laughs> I've read that passage over and over. It seems that Jesus bent over. And you, you know, like you're a kid at the beach or something, or you're, you're, you're on a sand, a, a dusty substance and you write a message. He bent over and he wrote something. He wrote something there in the dirt. And it, boy, it affected every one of those men. Jesus wrote something. I don't know. It doesn't, the Bible doesn't tell us what he wrote, but he wrote something. And boy, it stunned every one of them. Now, I, I have my opinion on what Jesus wrote. I believe he knew what was in the heart of every one of them. He knew everything they had ever done in their life. He knew every sin they had ever committed. He knew every sexual iniquity they were involved in. And, and no doubt they were probably involved in quite a few things. That very day, maybe maybe some of them, maybe all of them had committed adultery themselves. We don't know. But I think it tore in their heart. He knows about us. He knows what we've done. And then Jesus said, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Wow. He knew what their sins were. He must, there must have been, I'm, I, I know I'm, I'm, I'm creating something that's not there, but come on, use your common sense. He communicated to each of those men what they had, they, they, they knew they had sin. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. And each one put down his stone, his rock, and walked away. And there the woman was left all alone. With the master. And Jesus said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? She said, I have none, Master. I have none. What did Jesus do next? Did he judge? Oh, he had already judged her. <laughs> he, he had already judged her. She had been found guilty. She was guilty. She knew she was guilty. And her, committing that sin, she had opposed herself. She was guilty, and she was in defiance of God. And she knew it. Just like all of those men, they knew what they had done. They knew of their sin. They, they knew that <laughs> they, they, they couldn't cast the first stone because they were guilty. They had a beam in their own eye. But, but they were going to kill this poor woman who had the moat in her eye. And, and Jesus said, if you're not guilty, then cast the stone. But Jesus said something to her that was very meaningful. See, many people have told me, see there, Jesus, he didn't judge her. He told her, go on your way then. But he did judge her. He says, go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. Or something worse would happen to you. How can it be worse than that? <laughs> Fixed to die. Well, you could go to hell forever. Go and sin no more. She had been judged. You know, the best kind of judgment is when you judge yourself. I was listening to a case on TV the other day. I, I like these crime shows. Man, let me tell you mainly why. I like to see the, the bad guy get it. I, I always, I, I like the very end, you know, when they have the trial and they're, the, and, and I like to, and I, and I always complain. 
If the guy committed a murder and he only gets 20 years, I say, oh, that was too easy. He should have got the death penalty. <laughs> That tells you where I'm at, doesn't it, folks? But th this guy, he 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 just wanted he he was a murderer and he murdered somebody that he didn't even know because he just wanted to see what it felt like to kill him. He just wanted to kill somebody because he he wanted to see what it felt like. And there he was standing before the judge. He had been found guilty. They found him guilty. Oh, he was, he had a lying silver tongue. He stood up before the, it was a witness for the court and said, I didn't do it and all this other kind of stuff, but he did do it, of course. He was found guilty. And the judge asked him, you know, what have you got to say for yourself? Right before the sentencing, the judge was fixing to sentence him and, oh, this guy just commenced to crying. Oh, he cried and he was just tears were rolling down his face. Now, I've studied psychopaths in my life and, I looked over at one and I said, watch this. This is going to be a good one. Psychopaths can't, cannot help themselves. If they could, they may get out of it. They, they may actually say something to help their situation. I mean, here the judge said, you got a chance. I'm fixed to sentence you. Tell me what you want to say. And let me tell you what the guy told the judge. He said, your honor, <laughs> I can't believe the jury found me guilty. <laughs> I can't believe the jury found me guilty. <laughs> he didn't apologize to anybody. He didn't say, I'm sorry for my crime. He didn't say that the man I murdered just for fun, I didn't even know him. He didn't say his family have lost him and I, and I did this horrible thing. I'm so sorry. I, I, I repent of this terrible thing that I did. No, no. He said, Ooh, I can't believe the jury found me guilty. He was shocked. You see, he was a brilliant guy. They said he was a, a you know, he, well, anyway, he thought the jury would find him innocent. He thought he could, he could talk him out of it, but he couldn't. And I'll tell you, the judge stuck it to him. And I was happy to see that. I was thrilled to see that. I was pleased to see the righteous judgment. Now, think about it. Jesus first says, judge not that ye be not judged. Are you ready to be judged? Then go judge somebody else. Do you know what the law says? Do you know what your, what your heart says? And you have to read your heart very accurately because God has laid it on your heart exactly what is what is so, what is true, and what is not true, then then you, you're a judge. We're all a judge. We're, we've got to be judges. You've got, to, this must be a righteous world or it's not worthy at all. It's not worthy of the Christian. And I'm afraid most of the time that's true. But that doesn't mean you have to add to it. And if you're a person that they say, oh, John or Bob or Sally or Kelly is such a sweet person. They never say bad about anyone. Boy, you need to look at your behavior. Something's wrong with you. You're defying God. I think you're, you, you may be one of the most evil people on earth, but you look so meek, so wonderful, so kind. You never, you wouldn't say a bad word about anybody. You would even let the murderer get off. You would let the, the terrorist get off. Well, the terrorist down in Orlando, he hated himself because he was a gay man. And, and, and he felt so bad being gay that he went out and killed 53 other people. I, I feel so sorry for him. Anyone who calls himself a Christian, who claims that a Christian cannot judge others, is not a Christian. Did you hear what I just said? If you say you can't judge as a Christian, then you are not a Christian. You're spreading a false anti-Christian doctrine. Did you, did you understand me? Everyone out there that says, don't judge. You can't judge me. Judge not. Without adding anything about what Jesus said here, Jesus says, take the beam out of your own eye and then you can see clearly to judge. Oh, yes. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. Whatever you judge in your life, do you use extra, do you exercise righteous judgment? You, you can't be a good Christian unless you exercise righteous judgment against yourself. Because everybody who sins opposes themselves. Say, how can that be? 
I'm an individual. When I sin, as long as I keep it a secret, it's okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. You harm yourself. You oppose yourself. And you have damaged yourself. And you've got to get that straight between you and God or you won't be forgiven. And John says in the Bible that God is faithful and just. And he will forgive the, 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 the sinner who asks him for forgiveness. You see, he's not a cruel judge, but he wants repentance. He wants to know you're really sorry about that situation. You're, you're not going to try to get away by saying you can't judge me or who's to judge. You've got to look at your own situation in truth. You've got to worship Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth, John chapter 3. And if you're guilty, you've got to say, I'm guilty. And you've got to make it right. You can't say, well, I, I, I'm a sinner and yeah, I was wrong, but I'll just go on. I'll just go on. No, 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 you've got to make it right. Now, sometimes people who try to make things right end up making things more wrong. I had a man overseas came up to me and told me that he had ran around on his wife while he was over there. The, the men in uniform could not take their families overseas. But he went and got drunk one night, caroused about with his fellow soldiers, and ended up going to bed with some woman. He told me he really felt very terrible about it and, and sinful actions, and he was very repentant about it. Now, what did I do? I said, well, you were wrong. Your wife's being a faithful wife back home in America, and here you are. You done this terrible thing. You need to, to repent, and you, you've got to you've got to make this right. Now, how do you make it right? Well, he wrote her a letter. I sinned against you. I did this. Why wasn't he just a good Christian man? Why didn't he? And his wife was really hurt. I think he did the wrong thing. He should have vowed never to do that again. He should have got forgiveness from God, but never, never, never do that again. But he said, well, I'm doing right by telling my wife what I did. No, he was punishing his wife. He punished her. I did this and now you know about it. Ha, ha, ha. He was punishing her. My friends, you've got to stop your ungodly lifestyle. And you've got to tell others that you do believe in judgment. And someday everyone will be judged. And many who thought they did so good are, are going to be the most disappointed. Oh, yes. They will stand before the throne of God and say, look at all the things I did in your name. Look at all the things I did in your name. Why well, even cast out devils? And Jesus will turn to them and he will say, I never knew you. Depart from me. Get away from me. I don't even know you. And that will be the saddest day of their lives. The saddest day of their life. When Jesus says, I never knew you. Well, what is, what about it? Did Jesus tell us to judge? Oh, yes, he did. We're to judge. We're to do it with kindness, with love, with grace. But we are to do it. The Pope is wrong. Who am I to judge? Well, if he was a Christian, he would know. Franklin Graham, you're wrong too. You should know. I'm Tex Morris. It's been great being with you. My prayer is you'll tune in each week during the same time and discover the power of prophecy.